Okay, we'll uh, open it up now for Q&A, which uh, Rakesh will handle. I do want to acknowledge that uh, our other sponsors of this event, which include the Indian <coughs> American Muslim Council and the Center for South Asia and the Abbasi Center. I just wanted to raise like, two issues which you've highlighted in your paper. I think one has to do with, uh, I appreciate that, you know, in the analysis you have to use kind of global categories of religion, so Muslim, Sikh, Jain. But obviously you also pointed out that there's a great deal of heterogeneity within these groups. And it may be worthwhile looking at examples where you have particular Muslim groups that have been more successful mm -hmm. in making inroads through the education, mm -hmm. they cross that threshold that mm -hmm. you've mm -hmm. been talking about, and have a much more advantageous position mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the field of, of economy and development in right. India. Right. So that may be one way of creating case studies mm -hmm. that actually allow Mm -hmm. uh, other Muslims and other groups should sure. have a reference. Sure. That's sure. one. Sure. I think the other thing is if the context of this exercise and the policy points that you raised essentially ask for action from the state. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. And the state, as you pointed out, is not only overwhelmed uh, by what it has to do, but that. Uh, Sort of the lines of action are terribly complicated by political dynamics. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you go back to sort of even pre uh, kind of independence notions that there was a very important role for civil society in generating education. It's something that I think my experience is primarily in Africa and right. I've been looking <clears throat> there. Uh, but you, you pointed out the, the question of the madrasa. And while it is kind of frozen in time now, and it only addresses a very limited form of religious education, we were able to very successfully harness madrasa education in Africa to actually enable students to cross mm -hmm. the threshold mm -hmm. uh, by creating within the madrasa itself mm -hmm. uh, ways of learning and acquiring competencies that would be required in the public school right, system. Right. So I'm wondering if there is a role to be played by the private sector, mm -hmm. not by engendering quotas, with it, but by uh, harnessing their resources to create uh, charter schools, you know, whatever we may call right. them, <coughs> as ways of enhancing this movement across the threshold that I think you rightly point out is so critical to the whole process. So, it's a very good point. I mean, uh, uh, just a quick response. We are actually thinking of, we started the process of doing case studies in two locations, Kerala and Hyderabad, where there is evidence coming from uh, the local community where the participation of Muslims in education dramatically changed when the Gulf labor market opened up. So there is a response to give an opportunity. And similarly, something similar is happening in Hyderabad, where new uh, employment opportunities came in. So we are trying to figure out uh, the linkages between employment and education through these case studies. So you're absolutely right. Uh, and we are searching for similar case studies elsewhere. So if any of you have ideas on that, I would love to focus on that. But moving forward, we want to do that case study. And that's very important to understand the dynamics better. Uh, on the participation of the private sector, the idea of incentives in terms of additional grants is essentially for the private sector. So you're absolutely right. Uh, if you want to en enhance the scope of the role of the private sector, you'll have to create some incentives. They will not do it on their own to begin with. Later on, even in the job market, it might become a corporate social responsibility. But for a short period of time, a tax incentive might create an impetus. Similarly, for private sector schools, uh, a grant incentive might create an impetus to have a more diverse student population. So uh, that's the idea of, of the final point which I was trying to raise. 
And the madrasa thing, you're absolutely right. If the student population that is going to madrasa is high, that can potentially be a very, very potent way to move forward. Uh, Indian government has a madrasa modernization program support. And those madrasas who want to modernize education, they get government support. But there are very few of them who are trying to do that. And given the fact that a very small proportion of school-going population actually goes to madrasas, even if all the madrasas modernize, the impact may not be as high. And that's the reason why, in the context of India, madrasas may not necessarily be the best option. During the Sacha Committee time, we did go to several madrasas who, which are wonderful, actually. They are trying out things which uh, is, are amazingly modern. And they are able to run these parallel streams of Duniyavi and Dini Talim in a manner that the students get exposed to state-of-the-art uh, curriculum, uh, curricula for science and computers and so on. At the same time, they also have exposure to Dini Talim. But there are very few of them. Not very good. Yeah. Uh, Kakesh, I'm uh, Sudhir Kulkarni. I'm from, I'm an alumnus of uh, IIM Calcutta. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my question relates to women's role mm -hmm. in the whole you know, education system. There have mm -hmm. been several experiments I know of, Anganwadis and so right. on. But right. has, have you done a research or has this research uh, covered that aspect mm -hmm. of uh, women's contribution mm -hmm. towards moving the kids over that threshold that mm -hmm. you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, once again, a good question. I mean, after a great deal of difficulty from the National Sample Survey data, we were able to get the link between the children and the parents and get parental education. Uh, and as soon as you do that, the sample size shrinks because, you, because you're trying to match. And you're absolutely right. Other studies have shown that mother's education is critical. Uh, so we were trying to figure out the parental education of the mother's education of the child. And as soon as you do that, the sample shrinks so dramatically that you can't analyze it by social religious categories. You can analyze it for all children and how their education gets affected for mother's education. But that clearly shows that mother's education is very critical. But if you want to analyze it by caste or community, then the sample is too small to analyze. So that's why we have not done it. But that. It's a very, very valid point. Yeah. Uh, so I, I just was wondering about uh, the kind of evidence for the benefits of the quota system over the years. And so you were, you were stating that, um, I mean, there's sort of very little evidence that the quota system was effective. So there's a recent paper published in the Economic uh, Journal just last month in April 2012, which shows, um, which, which they argue empirically, uh, using the National Sample Survey data that uh, actually the vast majority of the caste, uh, the differences in wages across caste um, can be explained by the quota system. So that actually 40% or something along those lines of the caste difference uh, decline in the wage gap uh, was a direct result of the quota system. And this, excuse me, there's another paper that uh, several economists have recently uh, written where they use data for, for an entire state and look at uh, students who were accepted through the quota system to uh, engineering colleges and they found out that um, actually a, a good deal of the gap in achievement uh, was also um, reduced uh, because of preferential uh, you know um, allotment of seats towards scheduled tasks and uh, faculty. I would like to look at this because the paper that I have seen, uh, they have found that the uh, the wage gap is significantly higher for the people who come with quotas. Of course, if you compare people who come with quotas with those who have not got quotas and they are in the same community, of course, there will be a wage differential because they have gone through education in a premier institution. Uh, but we had done a small exercise for I am the birth graduates, and we found that uh, post. Uh, <coughs> Graduation, uh, if you look at the placement records of the students, the people who have come with quotas have significantly lower salaries as compared to those who have not come with quotas. So, the, so uh, therefore, the argument that you need to do something more with these people after you give them preferential entry uh, is very critical. So I'm not suggesting that people who come with quotas do not have any benefits. They do. The question is how many of them get it? 
And uh, what is the impact of that on the larger uh, this thing? I, but the economic general thing, I would love, love to see that, because I, uh, the problem with the national sample survey data is that uh, it only looks at regular jobs. And if a significant proportion of the marginalized groups are opting for self-employment jobs, and earnings in self-employment are not available. So you end up comparing only regular jobs. But there is a choice element associated with it. So whether we are comparing the right wages is, is a question. But I, I mean, I, I, I have to see that before I, yeah. So to pick up on what um, he just pointed out, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to question what do these terms achievement, et cetera, mean? Because mm -hmm. I was an IPS officer, and there was a huge, probably you might have done the study. I don't know who did it, but a huge study done mm -hmm. on uh, officers across different categories. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, it was found that uh, the ones who came in through the quota, the SCST quota, tended to be richer than the ones who came in through the general category, mm -hmm. which is very ironic. Um, not so much with the OBC category. And whilst you could say, if you measured achievement in terms of, yes, everyone's a district magistrate, magistrate or a SP or whatever, then they are at similar levels. Mm -hmm. But the performance differential, um, even in sport, even in sport, was phenomenally different. And this, is, this begs the question then, that uh, is uh, the quota system in itself enough? And if not, what are the alternatives? Because mm -hmm. It is a crude measure, and this is a crude tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming from an officer core, I can tell you that the officer core today is incredibly divided. And you and I hail from UP, and I can tell you in UP, it's so split up around, along caste lines that it's almost impossible to have a normal professional working relationship anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, the question is, as you said, I don't know the answers. Mm -hmm. And it is a question we have to ask right. as right. to what is the best policy measure. Is it investing in infant, uh, in, in, in education, infant education? Is it investing more in support? Is mm -hmm. it investing more in, let's say, affirmative action in getting people into education? Um, we have to figure this yeah. out. So I, I have not done this study, but I think you're referring to the study which talked about the creamy layer situation. I mean, Correct, the, the creamy layer one. Yeah. So, so that there should be a creamy so layer once one. Once again, the exactly. economic journal art article, I would like to see whether they have com yeah. they have control for economic status. Because <laughs> yeah. if I am a son of an IAS officer who got into the quota system and if my earnings are higher, I won't be surprised. So one will need to control for that. So anyway, if you, I'll take the reference from sure. you after the, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, for following up to your uh, correlation of uh, parental <coughs> education with uh, and its impact on uh, children, right. uh, have you considered uh, looking uh, into a broader category, which is homophily, mm -hmm. where people who are similar uh, tend to have children who are similar, and the same could, I mean, the educational factor could also be a transfer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. So, rather than just take a single um, uh, attribute of parental education. Mm -hmm. If you have you considered taking a, you know parental education, the area or the zip code in which they are coming from, uh, and a bunch of uh, other attributes that together would define homophily. Yeah, I mean, good point. But getting that kind of data is virtually impossible in India. So, uh, and the parental education we were i was quite surprised i didn't know that after you control for economic status caste community region uh, parental education will come up so strongly but uh, parental education uh, does come up so strongly but it, it conceptually what you're saying is absolutely right if i am located in delhi and uh, in the south of delhi my the chances of my getting to higher education are significantly different from if i'm i'm sitting in uh, some part of Bihar, that's absolutely true. Given the same parental education, that's absolutely true. But that is something which empirically is very difficult to capture. Uh, so given that, and, and to measure that is even more difficult and you require more variables. So what we are suggesting is that parental education is very simple to measure. You can't fudge it much. Uh, although you can still get certificates to show that I am illiterate or something like that. But it's difficult to, uh, getting a caste certificate is more, uh, has more opportunities for corruption than 
So if you can link it to parental education and cut a, it cuts across caste communities, economic status, I mean, it, you have a measure, but you have a variable, uh, which is fairly neutral in some sense. So you don't go by the creamy layer problem, you don't have to deal with the caste problem, you don't have to deal with the religion problem. You simply say, if uh, your parents are illiterate, then you have a higher chance of getting a uh, reservation. So that's the, what we are, sorry, back to the back first. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your in-depth analysis. Uh, the million dollar question is, how, how can we, have, we have a dynamic Muslim population in the United States. Also within that, we have subgroups other you know, the people also, last thing is also microfinancing. Mm -hmm. I, actually, I didn't get to your question. So my question is, uh, how can we help? You know, you, 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 you're presenting the data, right? We're here, so in, in the United States, we have a pretty dynamic Muslim population. Right, right. As you, so you can tell, and also, uh, there are some groups of Indians, you know, Hadrabadi and other from UP, right, other areas, right, right. and then there are lots of ways that people can help. One is microfinancing. Yeah, I mean, the, if if you're talking about the non-residents trying to help, it'll have to they'll have to help through building um, educational institutions and supporting educational institutions and trying to create uh, some kind of a financial or human support for people to go to school and stay there. Uh, that's the only way uh, one can truly help. Uh, I can't think of anything else. Yeah, please. So, are you thinking then about different kind of school being established. In the mm -hmm. sense of an adult education school, are mm -hmm. you talking about parents attending the same schools that children attend only in different hours? Because clearly there's a whole social mentality that's going to have to change. It's not just, well, now we're going to allow parents to go to school, but rather getting parents to believe that their education is of any value whatsoever. No, no, I maybe I didn't communicate. I, I was not suggesting that uh, we create uh, schools for parents. What I was suggesting was that if you want to have affirmative action policies and say that certain groups of kids will have um, quotas or reservation or scholarships, you focus on those kids whose parents are illiterate rather than whose parents, whose parents have higher education. So instead of saying that if you come from a, a scheduled caste background or a Muslim background, you will get these, these benefits, you say that irrespective of which group you come from, if your parents are illiterate, you will have these benefits. So the focus is not on your caste identity. The focus is on the, uh, of the parental education. So I'm just saying that the affirmative action variable should shift from caste community and economic status to parental education. That's what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting that you create schools for parents. That, that's, that can also be done, yeah. but that, that's a, a different kind of issue. Sorry, this person first, yeah. yeah. Uh, regarding the economic status, I have one simple question. You know, like if you see the historical uh, view of India, like India was ruled by almost 400 years by the Muslims. Then after that, the 200 years by the you know, English people. And mm -hmm. from the English people, all the communities are safe. So this is 600 years gap. Why the economic condition of Muslims is still not coming up, you know? Because 600 years is too long to come up with uh, you know, any economic We can have a, uh, the, uh, the Muslim rule and so the... Discrimination, you know, doesn't... I really fail to understand about the discrimination because it was 400 years by the Muslims, then 200 years by the someone, you know, who is uh, not Muslim, not Hindu. The but there was a partition in between, right? I mean, no, so... The partition just only, it and just it resulted years. in certain groups of people moving to Pakistan and the characteristics of people who stayed on in India was very different from the characteristics of people who went to Pakistan. Uh, so, uh, and even during the British rule, uh, there was discrimination. I mean, so, it, I mean, I can understand that during the Mughal rule there was no discrimination, but the British rule is, was not devoid of any discrimination. There were problems during that rule, and they actually used the uh, the tensions between the two communities to their advantage. So that may have uh, triggered, uh, many people argue, I'm not fully sure whether that argument is correct, that the, um, the re in, in terms of proportion, relatively better off Muslims went to Pakistan. And, and therefore, uh, 
what we were left with were relatively poorer people uh, among the Muslims, and that may have that's created a, its own dynamics. Very, very strong argument. I mean, my grandfather was at AMU, mm -hmm. Alibaba Muslim University, and, um, and he was at that time involved in, in, in the Quit India movement. Right. A huge percentage of his class, actually the best and brightest, he said, left uh, yeah. for Pakistan. They became Muhajirs. Yeah. Ironically, of course, they, they have their yeah. own problems. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, but please. Sorry, if I may comment it, on that. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at who migrated, yeah. out of roughly 8 million Muslims yeah. who migrated, about 5 million went from the Punjab, right. and there was no difference in the social economic that's true. status. Yeah. That's true. In Punjab, there wasn't. There was a population so transfer. Other 3 million, yes, there's some truth, but even that is debated. So mm -hmm. there is some... I think AMU is an asymmetric <laughs> sample yeah. because AMU so was. That's why like, I, I started by saying that I'm not very really sure to what extent you can agree so with. Not yet. That's a yeah. point taken. Yeah. You're right. But uh, we have a, you, the point that you were speaking about the 400 years. No, you have actually yes, of course. There's 200 years as Rakesh was pointing out. The British particularly discriminated against the Muslims, yeah. especially post the mutiny, 850. So that history you need to update. Uh, yeah. A couple of items you you actually addressed. One is the uh, uh, security. The, the, the key thing is about security is the major problem with the security concern is to having a free movement of the people, and especially in, among the Muslims. I'm from Ahmedabad, and I remember the 2002 the riots. And since then, you know what is happening. And uh, even before that, right. if you want to have your entrepreneurship somewhere else other than the area you're in will not go there sure. because you know you're going to get burned. So that security concern needs to be addressed very clearly when it comes to education. Uh, and along the same line is the discrimination, which we are talking about is been there. I've been in a group in 60s there. And uh, I had a chance to go to college and everything. But I have seen that happen. In 1969, it was a big riot at the time. So. I don't know how this is going to be addressed with this, uh, this research you're doing, but I think security concern needs to be addressed very clearly to mm -hmm. have the free movement of the people mm -hmm. to go from one area to another <coughs> area wherever they can prosper. There's no chance of prosperity to have growth in economical uh, fairness yeah. for the Muslims at this point as yeah. I see it. Uh, because I know there is a real concern. If you go some other area, you will not be surviving there at certain point of time. You might be okay a mm -hmm. few years, mm -hmm. but after that something happens, you'll be gone. Uh, and another thing is discrimination also. Uh, is it perception or the real? I think there's a more reality than the perception because that's the reason a lot of Muslims probably do not go to higher education. It's like, what are you going to do after that? There's no chance of getting jobs. And uh, when you're going for your self-employment type of things, again, your growth is very limited because you are in a limited area. Mm -hmm. You cannot go beyond that point. Uh, 